Um, it kind of uh, feels in many ways so like home. Uh, so many of the things that have already been shared this morning, uh, whether through video story or encouragements or prayer or just some of the stuff you've said is very much in our heart too as a local church committed to building a, a multicultural intergenerational church on mission. Uh, that's, that's who we are as, as a church and it's uh, been a real joy to be with you this morning and I just bring warm greetings from, uh, from New Community Church. We're over as, as Pastor Paul just said in, in Sidcup and also we've got a site in Elton. We gather people from a wide range of stuff, lots of different nations. Um, part of the New Ground family of churches, we've got a name check in your, in your video which was, uh, which was really cool. And um, Paul and Debbie were uh, in our church for a while before planting here and it's real such a joy to see all that is go has gone on and is going on and believing God for a whole lot more and um, I just want to honor you Pastor Paul and Pastor Debbie and you and your team here for what you've done your faithfulness in in planting a church like happy birthday I honestly I, I am I'm part of as I said new ground new frontiers family churches we've got lots of churches in lots of different nations of the world and I've uh, been involved in lots of different church planting and um, like church plants is a very high percentage of church plants fail. I don't know if you know that, but it is an awful lot do. So the fact that he, I can't believe it's eight years. I genuinely can't believe it's eight years. It does not feel like eight years, but the fact you're here after eight years and some of you are looking, you've joined in in the last eight years, what are you talking about? Now, honestly, this is amazing. This is amazing. The last time I was actually with you was at Charlton, you're at Charlton Athletic, and even seeing from then to, I can't believe that's been so long ago either, but forgive me for not coming back sooner. <laughs> um, but just to see what has gone on, I'm so grateful to God for. And birthdays and anniversaries are a wonderful moment to look back, as you already have done, with gratitude and thankfulness to God for His faithfulness, and uh, so grateful for all of that. But birthdays are also a good moment uh, to look forward as well in faith and with eager expectation of all that is God will continue to do in you and through you in accordance with the promises contained in his word. And I just in preparation for today, just wanted to come and encourage you with a few things. Haggai 2 verse 9, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, yeah. says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I'll give you peace. And I just feel that sense of that is a promise of God from Scripture, that because you are hidden, your life is hidden in Christ, all the promises of God find their yes and amen in Christ, and your life is hidden in Christ, and you are part of His body, the church, that promise is coming to you. The latter days of this house will be greater than the former. And we've already heard it prayed earlier. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Yeah. That's a promise, right? And you understand that, that that's a promise of advance. Because gates are defensive things. Yeah, they stop things from coming in. And it says here the promise, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. So that's a promise that the kingdom of God shall advance, that the church shall advance and plunder the gates of hell and go and grab people out of darkness and bring them into the light. That's a promise of God for this local church. Again, Matthew, uh, Matthew 28, all authority, says Jesus, in heaven and earth, all authority, not just a little bit, not just for Sunday mornings, not just for things we can kind of see or get our head around, all authority has been given to me, says Jesus. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Love the fact that you're doing the next bit today, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them. I love this stuff. We're passionate about spiritual formation teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And here's the promise. Behold, I am with you always yeah. to the end of the age. As we go, as we go about the mission of Jesus, that's the promise that he is always with us. So on your anniversary, there's this looking back. Well done. Well done, good and faithful servants. And then there's this looking forward. Keep going. But keep going with faith. I want, you to, I want you to, if you don't remember anything else I say today, I want you to remember this. Keep going with faith. Believing, it's already been said, I love this phrase, I say it in my church all the time, believing that the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. The best is yet to come. Jesus is building his church, that he's with you. God's doing this. But you know this? 
we're all involved. Each of you is involved. Not just the pastors who stood up, not just the serving team who stood up, but every single one of us who calls this local church home is involved in the mission of Jesus. And so God's doing it all. He's building his church, but we're involved. You know that, right? He's doing it all, but we're involved. And sometimes we can forget what the, I, that God's doing it. We think it's all on us. No, it's not. But sometimes we can forget that God's using us and think it's all on him. No, it's not. God is building his church, but he's using us. And so the part we play, that's what I want to focus on today, is about adopting a posture of faith and then acting on it. Faith doesn't just remain here. Yeah. It moves forward. We want to be like Abraham in, in Romans chapter 4. Paul says, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convinced. Your version might say fully persuaded. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. And that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. That's the kind of faith we want to have, like Abraham, fully convinced, fully persuaded that God is able to do all that he's promised. If you have a Bible with you, uh, we're going to start in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. You can open it up or switch it on, whatever you have Bible-wise. But the, this is the great chapter of faith. This is the call to faith and endurance. Verse 1 of Hebrews 11, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old receive their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And then the writer of Hebrews begins this great long list of names who we might consider the uh, the heroes of faith. We've got Abel and we've got Enoch and we've got Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and, and so on. But there's one verse I just want to draw our attention to. Verse 6. Look at it with me. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. That's God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's a big call, right? Yeah. That's a big statement. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And this here that we see here in Hebrews 11, this is the nature of <laughs> biblical faith. And we've got to ensure that our faith is thoroughly biblical, not some sort of worldly influenced kind of cheap imitation of faith. Do you know that there are only two influences in your life? You know that, right? There's two influences on your life. There's the Word of God and there's the world in which we live. And if you are not actively being shaped by one, you will be actively or passively shaped by the other. There's no two ways about it. If you are not being shaped by the Word, you will be shaped by the world. And it's like, no, 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 I'm, I, I, I can be stand strong. No, you can't. The tide of the world is very, very strong. The Word of God is stronger. If you're not actively being shaped by it, you will be shaped that way. So get this in you and allow this to shape you. And this, the Word of God, is what shapes our faith. Because worldly faith is not faith at all. Worldly faith is kind of, it manifests itself in different ways. It manifests itself as like wishful thinking. I've got faith that England are going to win tonight. <laughs> there ain't no faith. <laughs> Right, you can say that if you want, but no, no, no. That, that's just kind of like a, I, I hope it happens. And as an English person, I, I really hope it happens. But it's not grounded in anything other than kind of a bit of optimism. Yeah. Or sometimes kind of cheap imitation of biblical faith, worldly faith, dressed up with a little bit of Christian language, is kind of actually faith that is just grounded in what we can actually see. Something that is kind of visible before it. A sort of, it's faith that kind of says, well, I'll see it. I, I, I'll believe it when I see it. You know, I kind of, it's a sort of, I'll have faith for it. I'll have faith for 2030 vision when I, when I see a few more people. Or I'll have faith for planting churches when I've seen that we've actually done one. It's kind of like based in what you can earthly see and what we can accomplish and what we think we can kind of do when it's all safe, when it's no risk. I, so I got faith for 1.5 million once you get a light to around 950,000. Then I'll start chipping in a bit. Because at the moment, at 6%, I ain't got a lot. Well, 
No, no, that ain't faith. That ain't faith. Now, there are some moments in life where it's a good idea to kind of wait and, uh, and see that you can see something. Like, I ain't going bungee jumping until I've seen someone else do it, right? I ain't getting in a plane unless I know that the pilot is actually a qualified pilot. I don't care how much faith you've got. If you can't fly that plane, I ain't getting in it. So there are certain things which actually kind of make sense to act like that, but not biblical faith. Not when it comes to the things of God. You see, biblical faith is not wishful thinking. It's not blind kind of ignorance. It's not just hoping. It's thoroughly logical. It's thoroughly grounded. I love that you're doing at Youth Alpha with your kids because it's based. you can go and explore this stuff. You can actually go and, what is the evidence for the resurrection? Go and explore it. There's like nothing to be scared of. Like, how do we, can we trust the Bible? Well, there's this whole science called textual criticism. You can go and look it up. Go and go on. If you've never done an alpha course, just kind of adopt a child for a few weeks and go and do that one, right? But it's, it's thoroughly logical. You, Christianity is not leave your brain at the door as you come in. Check out intellectually. It all adds up. It stacks up. It's not blind. It's thoroughly logical. But it also requires an awful lot of unseen. Believing in the promises of God that you have not yet seen. That's biblical faith. You see, we often think of faith as just kind of like some looking back mental agreement. I, oh yeah, I can look, I can, I believe that. I believe Jesus died and rose again. I, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe, I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I, yeah, I, I, I look back and I believe. And there is an element of Christian faith that is looking back and saying, yeah, I believe that these things happened. But most of biblical faith is not looking back, it's looking forward to things not yet seen. Verse 1 of Hebrews 11, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Biblical faith, yep, it does look back. It's grounded in history, but it also looks forward to that which is yet unseen. And it says, I believe that too. And these folk here in Hebrews 11, they can't see it, but they believe the promises of God. It's why when you go and read all of their different stories in the Old Testament, they persevered in the face of hardship. It's why they didn't give up when the going got tough. It's why they held on in moments of silence where God seemingly isn't doing much. It's why they did things that made no sense whatsoever. I mean, we, because you grew up in church, you know the Noah's Ark story. You kind of think, yeah, of course, he built this big ark. Put yourself in that for a moment. Like, that is nuts. He had faith in something he couldn't yet see and believed the promise of God, so went for it. See, biblical faith is built on the promises of God. The apostolic promises of God recorded in his word and the prophetic promises spoken over us as a church. You see, the church is a people who live on promises. We're a people who grow on promises. We're a people who are sustained by promises. We're a people who please God by trusting his promises. That's what faith is. Without faith, verse 6, it's impossible to please God. And each of the people here in, in Hebrews 11, they are famous for their faith. That's why they're in the list. But I don't know if you've ever noticed that when the writer describes them, all of them, their faith is presented in terms of some sort of action. Have you noticed that? Abel offered a sacrifice. Didn't just do a Bible study on it. He went and did it. Noah constructed an ark. He didn't just get his friends together and go, hey, if we were to do this, what might it look like? He actually did it. Abraham, Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. Sarah received power. Isaac invoked a blessing. Jacob blessed. Joseph made mention. Moses, he acted. He refused the world. The people actually had to cross the sea. They didn't just stand there and go, oh, that looks amazing and impressive that the Red Sea is just split. Uh, uh, after you, no, they had to go and actually do it, believing by faith that that which had opened, a door which had opened for them, they now had to walk through. Yeah. Rahab. She gave a friendly welcome. I love the normality of some of these things. Like the ordinariness of some of these things. By faith, she gave a friendly welcome. That was dangerous for her. Yet by faith, she did it. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. They conquered, they enforced, they obtained, they stopped, they quenched, they escaped, they made strong, they became mighty, they fought. 
Faith, apart from action, is not faith. Let me say that again. Faith, apart from action, is not faith. It's entirely one thing. It's one thing to say, well, I believe all of this stuff. It's entirely another to do something about it. You know, in Hebrew, in the biblical language Hebrew, there isn't even a noun form for the word faith. In Hebrew, it's only ever expressed as a verb, which basically means faith in Hebrew, in biblical Old Testament language, is only, only ever exists as an action. It never exists apart from an action. It's never, I believe, on a, in a Sunday meeting for a few minutes, yeah, preach, bro, you go, yeah. No, 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 Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, with your wallets, with your time, with the, your treasure, with your talents, with everything that you have, it says, I believe and I'm in. Yeah. So how do we activate faith? Well, just in these last few moments together, I, I just, it's three things I felt the Lord want to impress upon me to impress to you of three ways to activate faith. And the first is, really, it's about believing stuff and then doing something about it. So the first is this, God believing that God is always at work and then changing things in your own life to go and join him. God's always at work, so we need to look for where he's working, and then we need to change things to join him. You know, each of these stories of the men and women in Hebrews 11, it's different. They're all different, and yet they're united. They're united together because in different ways, they are each playing their part to fulfill the story of God's redemption in humanity. They're each playing their own part. They're each running in their own lane. They're each doing the thing that God has called them to do, not what God has called somebody else to do. God's got a call on your life. There's a lane that he's set aside for you to run in, and it doesn't look like my lane, and it doesn't look like the lane of the person next to you. God's gifted you in different ways to go and fulfill all that he has got for you, that you might bear much fruit. Do you know that bit we heard earlier? I, you didn't choose me, says the Lord. I chose you. You know, that's such good news, right? Because if it was the other way around, if I had chosen to follow Jesus, if I had chosen him, when the going gets tough, when life gets really difficult, he could legitimately turn around to me and say, bro, I never asked you to come along. Like, you chose me. I didn't choose you. Like, quit your moaning. Quit your whining. Like, man up a bit. No, 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 no. I didn't choose him. He chose me. So when the going gets tough, he's faithful to his promises, and his promises are that he'll never leave nor forsake me, right? Yeah. It means he will never let me go, that nothing can pluck me. Nothing can pluck me. Nothing can pluck you out of his hand. He chose you, and he appointed you to bear fruit. Run by faith in the lane that he's got you. And right from the beginning, God has been about gathering for himself a people from every tribe and every tongue and every everything are going to be joined together in the new heavens and the new earth. There will be people from literally every single class and color and creed and language and every everything. That's what God's about. That's the mission of Jesus. That's what we're involved in, the ingathering of the elect from every tribe and every tongue into the new heavens and the new earth. Because you know what else he's about? The renewal of all things. Because in the fall, everything got broken and God set about saying, no, 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 that which you, mankind, mocked up and broke, I'm going to fix and I'm going to redeem. And he set about a mission to renew all things and gather for himself a people from all tribes and all tongues. And he's called you out of darkness into the light, not to stay in the light and go, oh, isn't this pretty? But to go back into the darkness, to carry the light, to play your part in the renewal of all things and the ingathering of the elect from every tribe and every tongue. You know, in church, you can be a lot of things. You can be a little bit overwhelmed. You can be a little bit anxious. You can be a bit frightened, perhaps. You can be anything you want, but one thing you can't be is bored. When you understand what we are, I mean, you might be bored in moments like this where I'm speaking, but when you grasp what the church is about, yeah. that we're about the renewal of all things and the ingathering of the elect from every tribe and every tongue, that is what we're about. That is what you have been called to play your part in. Yeah. With your unique set of gifts and your sphere of influence, 
in the places where you live and the places where you work and the places where you play. That's what you're caught up in. That's what we're caught up in. That's what higher place is caught up in. That's what new community is caught up in. That's what every single local church, which is made up of normal people, is caught up in. And this plan of the renewal of all things is God's plan. It's not my plan. It's not your leader's plan. It's not Paul and Debbie's plan. It's not any of your pastor's plan. It's it's God's plan. And what he says comes to pass. And if we forget that it's his plan, we start, because we can do it, right? I'm forgetful. I forget things all the time. But when we forget that this is what we're part of and we start making it about something else, we are in a little bit of a dangerous situation for two reasons. We kind of start, firstly, we start making it about ourselves, about our empires and our dreams and our ideas and our fame. Brothers and sisters, it's never been about us. We must decrease that he can increase. Don't ever make it about us. I love what you're saying, believe in God for revival through here and other local church. It's not about our, they're not going to, I hate to break this to you. In 10,000 years time, no one is going to be singing about the name of the higher place church or the name of new community church or Saint whatever and Saint whatever. (laughs) They're going to be singing about the name of Jesus for all eternity and the second danger when we forget that it's all God's plan that we're involved in is our vision gets too small and we begin to walk not by faith but by sight and we are called to not walk by sight but to walk by faith and when our vision gets too small wow that's a dangerous place because we start having a cheap imitation of biblical faith. And we go, oh, well, let's just kind of tone it down a little bit. Let's just, no, 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 no. We don't tone it down a little yeah. bit. We find our fulfillment and our identity in all that God has called us to do. And he is about nothing less than the renewal of all things and the ingathering of the elect from every tribe and every tongue. That's what we're caught up in. And that remo- changes our perspective. We're not some little thing tucked away in the... I don't even know where we are, in the, wherever this place is, in the part of wherever this other place is. I mean, it's all big outside and grand, and I'm like, where are we going? <laughs> We're not some little thing tucked away in the corner of anything. Yeah. We're part of the global plans of a global God, yeah. and he's always at work. Yeah. So we need to look at where he's working, and we need to change things to join him. You know, he's out there working in the lives of unbelievers, men and women who right now haven't even given it a thought to come to church. He's at work in their lives, and at some point, he's going to put you in their path. And you're going to say a word in season. And it's not necessarily going to be the whole thing. You're just going to be by your faithful presence, by what you say, and it'll, oh. And then God will bring somebody else in. And they, in their little obedient way, will play their part. You know, there was some stats a few years ago that the average person who heard the, by the time they made a Christ, became a Christian, had heard the gospel like 10, 12 times, something like that. Yeah. We so often kind of just think it's all on this one moment, me now, pressure on me. You ain't saving nobody. Yeah. It's all on him. Yeah. But he uses you. Yeah. Play your part. Yeah. But he's not just working out there in the lives of unbelievers. He's working here in our church too. He's not building a meeting that we attend. He's breathing life into a body of which we're part. So in all situations, we believe that God's at work. And consequently, we carry with us a vision that is bigger than what we can see. How are you doing over that? I know how you're doing as a church. You are carrying a vision that is bigger than what you can see. But how are you doing on that personally? Do you need fresh faith for God for something? Like for where you live? for your part of this city or wherever you've come from today, for a particular project you want in a run or a thought. Maybe it's faith for a family member or a friend or a circumstance or a situation. Whatever it is, have you perhaps got your eyes down looking at the problems rather than your eyes up looking at God with faith? See, we want to be like Caleb and Joshua in Numbers 13. You know that moment where the, God's promised that the people of God will walk into the promised land. And so they send out the spies. Go and check it out. Go and see what it's like. They're right on the edge of the promised land. And all those spies, they come back and they have a report of all the giants and all the impossibilities and all the things that we, there's just, there's no way. There's fortified walls. There is massive, scary people. There's just no chance we're going to be able to do this. All the reasons why it was impossible. But Joshua and Caleb were told to have a different spirit. Why? 
or because by faith they saw something different. You know, the giants were there, right? They didn't make them up. The fortified cities were there. They didn't make it up. All the impossibilities were there. They didn't make them up. But Caleb and Joshua saw something different by faith. They carried a vision in their hearts, believing that God's at work. And they came and said, we can do this. We can take this. How's your faith? Like not collectively. How's your faith? For the things God's called you to, for the part that he's called you to play in the next eight years of this local church. You see, faith in Christ and his promises, his plans, really believing that this is where we're going, it leads to a bigger vision. When we trust in ourselves and what we can achieve, we only see small. But when we trust in Jesus, we begin to see big. And the spiritual need and the spiritual opportunity is far bigger than we think. But the God that we serve is far bigger still. And he's called you by faith. Look for where he's at work. He's always at work. And change some things to join him. Second thing, I just felt the Lord want to impress this, impress this upon me to impress upon you for all the bigness of this mission. And it's big, it's massive, it's, it's global, it's every everything. For all the bigness of this mission, most of it is actually outworked in very ordinary places in very ordinary ways. Did you know that? Like it can be sometimes so easy to think that mission is somehow for the super saints. You know, like the elite squad of Christians, like the experts, like that's for them. That's great. My job is just to say, go for it. Well done. And I'll politely clap. No, 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 no. When you read scripture, you see that most of the advances of the kingdom come at the hands of ordinary people, ordinary people who belong to an extraordinary God. The story of Acts is full of unnamed people doing the works of Jesus, loving the least and loving the last and loving the lost. There is only one superstar. His name is Jesus, and the rest of us are really quite ordinary people doing ordinary things to the glory of God. And even those that are named in Scripture, they're generally normal people doing normal things. Even the Hebrews 11 guys. Yep, there's some pretty impressive things that they do, but a lot of it is actually really quite normal. It's like really quite ordinary. For sure, in Scripture, we have kings and queens and warriors and princes, but you read, we also have bakers and butlers, and cooks, and fishermen, and hunters, and shepherds, and farmers, and scribes, and midwives, and teachers, and soldiers, and the carpenters, and craftsmen, and potters, and tent makers, and homemakers, and bankers, and musicians. Normal people doing normal things, but doing it for the glory of God. So whether you're a hedge fund manager, or you cut them for a living, it doesn't matter what you do, done for the glory of God, plays its part in the extension of the kingdom and the building of the local church. You know, the spread of the early church that transformed cities from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth, it came mostly at the hands of just ordinary people who carried the mission of God, not through platforms and formal ministry, but through homes and in workplaces and in the streets and in the communities where, where normal people live, work and play. Lots of people. Here's, here's the biblical thing that, where transformation takes place. Lots of people, normal people, doing lots of seemingly by themselves quite small things, put together, make a massive difference. Nehemiah tells us that that's how great walls are built. You know, in Nehemiah, everybody wants to be like the hero. I want to be Nehemiah, the, the hero standing there. Well, there was also guys who kind of built the fish gate. Can you imagine how much that smelt in Israel? There's also guys who built the dung gate. Like, if you're not sure what Dungate is, it's... I'm not sure I can say it. <laughs> like, literally, it is the place where it, you know... Somebody had to go and rebuild that bit. Nobody wanted to do that. Yet you read in Nehemiah that some of the people did that. They were like, like kind of like almost royal people. They were people who had high position. They said, you know what? I see something greater, so I am going to go and build the Dungate. That's how Nehemiah says that great walls are built. Israel, uh, Isaiah tells us that that's how cities are restored. Acts tells us that that's how the gospel changed the world. One brick, one step, one task, one person at a time. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Play your part in the smaller story. And remember, Isaiah 55 tells us that God's ways are not our ways. You know, in our culture here in the West, we celebrate and we publicize the big, the spectacular, the impressive We want to be able to point at something and go, wow, look at that. 
Like we do it all the time. We do it all the time. We want to be able to go, look at how many people were there. Look at all these amazing things that happened. We prefer the dramatic, the noisy, that kind of breakthrough. Ta-da! Most of us on our social media feeds don't just, I mean, if you don't believe me, just look at your social media of everybody. Like, even churches, dare I say this. We ain't putting like hashtag normal Sunday, that was average. Like, we, we, we tend to influence those things, the big stuff. But brothers and sisters, God's ways are different, right? For sure, there are some dramatic moments in scripture. Like there really are. Like even the book of Daniel, you think, wow, he did all of those things. That was like over 30 years. He did like three things in 30 years. The rest of what he did was just presumably normal. He didn't just fall asleep between all of that time and then wake up again. Oh, I'm in the lion's den. No, like there was just normal stuff he did and God used him. Because when that's a thing, right? In the small, faithful in the small, God will use you. God might end up using you for something big. He might not. What matters most is what will still matter most in a thousand years' time. Well done, good and faithful servant. If you're a three-talent kind of person, use your three talents for the glory of God. If you're a five-talent kind of person, use your five talents for the glory of God. If you're a 52-talent person, use your 52 talents for the glory of God. What you can't do is go, well, I did them more than him or her. God will deal with him or her by himself. He wants to talk to you about what you're doing with your life. And if you think about it, actually, think about some of, for all the big stuff, even Jesus did lots of big stuff, right? But for all the big stuff, think about some of the metaphors that Jesus used in his teaching. He tended to talk about small things, single things, quiet things. He talked about seed and salt and leaven. Small things, but small things that have effects that far outweigh their appearance. Small things that make a big difference, often in a quiet way. Seeds grow slowly and quietly into big old trees. Salt quietly and efficiently preserves and keeps things in a manner disproportionate to its size. Leaven changes the shape and the nature of what it's added to. And truthfully, most of this is slow. Hardly any of it is dramatic or quick. In fact, most of the Bible is agricultural, right? It's planting seeds. And the person who looks for quick results in seed planting, well, they're going to be very disappointed. I ain't no farmer. I'm not much of a gardener, but I do know this. If I want potatoes for dinner tomorrow, it's not, good, not much good planting it today and expecting them to be ready tomorrow. That's just not the way it works. You plant potatoes or anything else, that kind of, there are stretches of darkness, stretches of silence, where you don't feel like you can see very much happening, at least not on the surface, but in the darkness in the quiet, out of sight from your eyes and my eyes. But what God sees, he's working and he's growing something. And in due season, that thing rises. And in the periods of darkness, in the periods of waiting, no farmer, no gardener thinks, well, that was a waste of time. In fact, actually, you've got to give away. You think about the metaphor of planting for a moment. I, I honestly, I'm not a gardener or a farmer. I've watched Clarkson's farm. I know a little bit. When you plant seed, no farmer is thinking, well, that's a waste. In one sense, it is. You have to let go. You have to literally take it, what you've got in your hand, and plant it. It literally kind of almost, in a sense, has to die. But then the growth comes. And God's at work. That's the way of God. In due season, we reap a harvest. Slow, quiet, often hidden, God's ways. Lots of ordinary people doing all small things, often unglamorous, and truthfully, how quick we are to dismiss those things. We say things like, oh, it's just a drop in the ocean. It'll make no difference. Just like a drop in the ocean. What, what real difference can I make? It's just a drop in the ocean. Do you know what? Actually, that is all the ocean is. Lots and lots and lots and lots of drops. You take away the lots and lots and lots and lots of drops and you have no ocean. You take away, I mean, all St. Paul's Cathedral is is bricks. You take away the bricks and there ain't no cathedral. All Buckingham Palaces or whatever the most impressive build, all these stunning impressive buildings around here, they ain't nothing but bricks. Individual bricks put together to build something massively impressive and amazing. Brothers and sisters, that's God's way of transforming a city. 
ordinary people doing ordinary things for the glory of God. And the third thing, the only way you can do any of this is to remember the centrality of worship, of fixing your eyes on Jesus and giving him worship and glory and honor, not just on Sundays, as important as these are, but day in, day out, season in, season out, through trial, through storm, the song we sang at the moment, on the, uh, the beginning, on the mountain, in the valley, all of those moments, keep your eyes on Jesus. You know, everything here, mission, all that kind of stuff, it has an end point. It has an end point. One day we'll see him face to face. Mission ends, but worship lasts forever. We will not do mission in the new heavens and the new earth. We will not have to do confession of sin in the new heavens and the new earth. But what we will do in the new heavens and the new earth is worship. And worship is the thing that sustains us. Keeping your eyes fixed on the one who died that all might live sustains us in the ordinary in the mundane, in the difficulty, in the trial, in the darkness, in the silence, in the waiting, it sustains us and it fuels us to keep going. And in the moments of victory and breakthrough, worship grounds us back in the reality that it's not about us, it's all about Him. Brothers and sisters, God's always at work. Change things to join Him. Remember that He's working through ordinary people like you and me for His glory. He's building us together to build something impressive, not for our fame, but for His not for our name, but for his. And the only way to keep going is to keep your eyes fixed fully on Jesus Christ, who died that you might live, who died that you might find forgiveness and freedom and joy. You're freed from a load of stuff, but you're freed to a load of stuff too. To play your part in the ingathering of the elect from every tribe and every tongue and the renewal of all things to the glory of God. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for all that you have done in this church. Believe in you, God, for much more. We also believe in you, Lord, that it will be done in your way and in your timing, not ours. And that you use ordinary men and women for your incredible, stunning glory. So, Lord, would you breathe faith into this people, into this community, into this church? Faith that doesn't just express itself in words on a Sunday, but faith that expresses itself in action Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and back again on Sunday. Faith that says, God's called me and gifted me with these things. I'm going to use them for his glory and my goods and the sake of the lost. Jesus, by your spirit, breathe, breathe faith into us right now. Gratitude for what you have done for the last eight years, but faith, eager anticipation for what you will continue to do and are yet to do for your glory, our good, and the sake of the lost. We ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.